Hello, livestock friends, and welcome to this edition of Before the Bid. This is a podcast dedicated to the livestock sales industry where we go behind the scenes of the operation and speak straight to the sellers. We discuss topics about the important aspects of their operation, location, the people behind the prep work, and talk about some of the animals that will be offered to you, the prospective buyers. Hopefully, you've got your sale catalog close by. You might have to go look through that pile on your desk. But if not, then you're probably like me and driving down the road or busy with chores around the farm. And that's okay, too. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you enjoy this segment of Before the Bid. I'm your host, Andy Howell. Welcome, Livestock friends, to this edition of Before the Bid. And on this edition, we go to the Panhandle of Texas, and we are going to talk about a uh, bred female sale. And this bred female sale is going to be held on SC Online Sales on December 8th. And we're talking to a guy that is a Ho- Oklahoma State graduate. He's an avid hunter. He's got Border Collie dogs. He's got a ranch horse operation. And he takes care of a lot of cattle and grew up in the cattle world and uh, a guy that uh, is very interesting to talk to and a guy that uh, uh, I've had a a good time talking to here. And again, we're going to the Panhandle of Texas and we're going to talk with Phil Williams. And Phil, we learned the other day that uh, you've got a new baby uh, just arrived here uh, about two weeks ago uh, today when we're recording this thing. So uh, here in in the middle of November and... uh, so uh, being being a new dad, uh, I'm sure things are busy, and especially getting ready for this sale and, and everything like that is, is keeping you pretty busy. Yeah, in fact, it is. It is, yeah. It's, it's been a good change for sure. She, she's quite a little blessing. We, we've so far, we've been really, we've been really fortunate. She kind of likes to eat on schedule and sleep all night and stays pretty happy and uh you know we're, we're we're pretty new into this so it, it certainly can change but uh yeah it's 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 good we, we're we're liking it so far it's she she's she is a blessing she's a bundle of joy for sure there's a lot of guys that are jealous right now uh that uh that she's that way and you said she likes to be outside more than she does inside she loves to be outside it's, jessica sent me a picture the other day she was doing doing dog chores and uh <laughs> and of course it was a nice day but she just happy as a lark out outside that's great. And the dogs like her as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. We want to talk uh, Want to talk some dogs uh, on this podcast. We want to talk some uh, ranch horses on this podcast. Uh, we want to talk quite a few things. And uh, I, I think uh, a lot of it starts there with, with where you began in the cattle world and, and growing up. And, and if you would, give us, uh, give us some history of that and, and let us know a little bit uh, about you and your growing up here in this cattle world. My parents both had town jobs most of the time growing up. There was periods that, that dad was full time running the yearling deal, but, but we, we grew up doing kind of a yearling thing, uh, been around yearling cattle. And then we moved to Follett whenever I was in grade school and started showing steers then. So that was kind of my introduction into, to the show cow world is, is when we moved there, we, we had a, we had a pretty good program of all that at that time that had old ag teacher that, that sure pushed it and sure liked it and 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 took a lot of pride in branding calves at Fort Worth and, and made everybody work for it. But so I kind of developed a little passion for that through through living that and then uh, somewhere midway through my high school career, I'd worked all through high school for, for Jeff Berkman and he he'd kind of give me an opportunity to start putting some cows together. And I had bought some cows that, in fact, there's still one cow. There was one cow that, that was a Bill Willers bread deal that that was the, one of the first cows I ever bought. You know, I mean, like, she had produced, back whenever a show cow weren't worth a lot of money, she would produced eighty or $90,000 worth of calves. And, you know, we had several at OYE had done pretty good and branded some Fort Worth out of her. And. And I still got a, you know, not much, a granddaughter or two of her around, but that she would have actually been uh, in the, the beginning set of those cows that I'd bought back then. Mm-hmm. But so then I kind of kept those cows together through high school, and then, you know, like I said, I, I went to school at OSU, uh, graduated there in '06, 
and came back and slowly started kind of building on that that set of cows mm-hmm. and, and at that time that was still a, a, a fairly strong club calf direction we were still breeding we were still breeding a lot of club calves back then of course it was a little easier to sell one back then than it is now but we were we were breeding a lot more club calves back then so that was kind of the direction of those and then somewhere probably around eight or nine i i kind of started trying to gravitate gravitate more towards the uh, the Simmental influence that that we've kind of really started pushing that focus towards now. Mm-hmm. And and you say you worked you worked yearlings growing up and and now you're you're kind of uh, in a little bit of a different uh, different operation. Yeah. So so where I'm actually at today is is I take care of cows for a couple of guys that they run good cows. Maybe not necessarily a a show cow focus, but a, but good cows. We We'll develop and we'll develop an AI uh, somewhere between 100 and 250 heifers every year. Breed four or five hundred head of mother cows every year. AI four or five hundred head of mother cows every year, and then we take care of, of course, like this time of year. Like I was telling you, this time of year, we're taking care of all the all the weaned yearling cattle on wheat. So so we'll wean you know out of let's say 750 or 800 head of those mother cows that we wean calves off of that are that are spring calves that will we now all those cattle will go to wheat so so we're we, you know we're kind of tending to those things uh on top of the we're kind of still getting cows to stocks and the guy i work for is kind of a multi-faceted has a lot of farm ground so you know it's the typical pick cows up and go to stocks all winter and you know all that jazz so that's kind of what we're in the middle of right now on top of on top of this sale and baby and everything else we're still taking care of 800 head of yearlings on wheat and moving cows to stocks and you know still neighboring a little bit we neighbor a bunch in this country still neighbor a little bit helping neighbors get calves lean and cows pregged and you know just a little bit all of it still now and you said you're on horseback most every day generally every day we're we're a horseback yeah try to as many cows there is you know it's it's hard to handle them enough to keep those things handleable if you're not you know a lot, a lot of times, what what a guy needs to do, or what we do, is is, is kind of feeding them cows a little. We, of course, in this part of the world, you know, we, we feed silage, which we're we're some of the few in this part of the world that feed silage. But we feed silage because we do have quite a few cows on irrigated grass, so we'll feed silage mm-hmm. uh, cows on irrigated grass. But then, in this part of the world, like range cows, cows that's running on range country, we we feed a we feed a you know just a straight cube. Uh, like a range cube cake mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, so you know, I'll string out a little cake and then trot through those cows just to kind of keep them, keep them used to looking at you and keeping those things gentle because, you know, it's <laughs> it's pretty easy for those cows to 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 not get used to being around some as you can imagine when, with that many to look at, you got you kind of got to stay on top of it. But and then like you know the the you got to get through that wheat pasture deal. Generally, every day horseback kind of keep your health thing You're right because you know like like a lot of that wheat country that we typically run on you know there's no there's no facilities there's no pens so so everything you got a doctor you've got a rope and doctor to to, to give shots mm-hmm. and, and things like that so so you've kind of got to you know you kind of already got to be stepping in that direction whenever you're going if that makes sense yeah and is that uh, is that kind of when you develop this this uh horse uh program that you have you know i've been working on that for a while you know, we we always had horses. We always rode horses. I never, I never would have had the idea to to, to breed a horse. Uh, I didn't even know what a broke horse was, but <laughs> probably somewhere around 2008, I'm guessing, I was working for the Duke Ranch, and we were taking care of several thousand head of yearlings on wheat, along with everything else. And I'd kind of run out of, I'd crippled horses and whatnot. Well, I'd went to college with Josh Hooker and Josh Hooker actually his dad is kind of my my starting place in the border collie world kind of one of my mentors in the border collie world Josh had trained reining horses for for Jack Collins Jackie Kershke uh, at that time so so I'd bought a two-year-old off of him and I'd bought a three-year-old and a two-year-old off of him uh, who both of those were mares that still still real big players in my broodmare band today but uh, I'd bought I'd bought two off of him, and then and I didn't know what the hell to do with them. I mean, I didn't, they were so broke that I didn't know what to do. I mean, they were they were just it was just a different world to me. And 
and he actually got between jobs that fall and i called and said hey i think we could use some help on wheat pasture and it was the it was the biggest blessing for my horsemanship that there ever was is he coming he come and, and worked for us for for several months that winter and and i learned more than i could ever know about horsemanship through those several months of a foundation and asking one to be more trained animal than than what i had ever been used to i mean up till that time i'd get on a cowboy broke one and go do my thing and put them up and never knew that they're one could go with you you know i mean there was ones that there's a there's a difference in one that that wants to be with you doing your thing and one that you're forcing so you know all all the things you ask if you're asking instead of forcing you find a better outcome and i didn't know any of that i just went and used them and did the thing and now i'm 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 cursed because i'm always trying to make a better one and, and part of making a better one seems to be always trying to breed a better one so the idea of all that is why I started doing it, but that's kind of why we do it. We, we do breed some colts to sell, but, but our, mm-hmm. our main deal is, is breeding horses for us to use. Yeah. And, uh, and the border collie dogs as well. Uh, you got into those border collie dogs that, that started probably a little bit sooner, but same line of thinking, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'd got first dogs and, and those dogs were fabulous. I, they're, they're a lot the foundation of my breeding program. I've, I've found things along the way and, and, and challenged different ideas and to, to where I, I kind of breed them how I want to breed them and how I want them to be bred. It, it doesn't fit very many people, but <laughs> they, they, they work for me. But, uh, yeah, so I, those dogs, those dogs then, you know, let's say the, the, the mid-2000s, that 2005, 2006, somewhere in there, those dogs had a fairly heavy import uh, base sheep dog primarily but were tough enough to be cow dogs Mm -hmm. so those those dogs at that time most of those dogs would have been imported from scotland Mm -hmm. and and the claims always been is the dogs imported from scotland were always tougher than the dogs from ireland and england and i don't guess i can tell you why i'm not really a sheep dog guy but but that's kind of the foundation one of the every every dog that that i've got goes back to the first dog nearly so that first dog that I that I ever had that I would have gotten in 2006 was a dog called Rip. Mm-hmm. And the puppy that we'll offer in the sales, we'll offer one puppy, one male puppy that'll be ready Christmas time. We'll offer one male puppy in that sale. And he's, he's that male puppy will be out of a, a bitch called Mist. Mist course you can find her on our facebook is, is kind of our matriarch female around here and she actually would be a granddaughter to the rip dog the first the first dog that we ever we ever had and you like and just like in your in your breeding program for the cattle and and for the dogs you like you like to put the focus on the female right build around the female yes sir so there may not be as much science to my thinking as what some guys you're going to listen to talk about but but you know for my, here, here's my deal, and my deal with the females we're going to offer even in this sale is you've got to build around females for consistency. Mm-hmm. So, so every female in this sale, you know, I'm not going to say you're going to raise a great one out of her. I don't know that, mm-hmm. but I can just nearly tell you if you breed her how she needs bred, you're never going to raise a bad one. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I feel like you know breeding females that are out of producing females and building off female lines and not breeding fads and breeding good cattle, you're always going to develop a set of females that's going to be consistent. Now, like I said, I mean, they may, you may not raise a great one every time, but I don't know that you'll ever raise a bad one. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. Most people overlook it because everybody's always wanting to raise the next great one. And that's, that's, that's fine too. But, you know, we've got to keep, we've got to keep foundation in, in the females of what we're doing. I feel like just, just to surely drive that that consistency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and we did talk. You you do believe some uh, on the bull side as well. I mean, it takes a total package to put this thing together. But but you believe Absolutely. you believe some on the male side as well. And and uh, how do you how do you help incorporate that with your with your female base? So a lot of what I like to do is, is look at at uh, it's it's easier to look at sire and dam that you know. But if you could go a generation deeper and know the grandsires and dams and actually know those cattle, like so, that's why I'm saying consistency-wise, mm-hmm. is you just keep you keep building generations. But in the bull thing, uh, you know, a big thing I like to do, like 
two of our main bulls we're using right now, both of those bulls go back to Starstruck, which was the dam of Wheelman, and that that cow has produced so many great ones. And I and I feel like, you know, you're still going to bring some consistency from that female in, into what you're doing because you've got a female backing it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, obviously the male on the male side's got to be good too. Right. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but. Right. But to build your confidence in what you're breeding, to build your consistency in what you're doing, there needs to be, you know, a female back in those things, in my opinion. Right. I agree. Whether you're talking border collie dogs or ranch horses or, yeah, or any, any other, you know, my, my theory with border collies is, and, it, and, and I, and I, you know, like most of these cows were selling a multi-generation deal. You know, I, I don't buy very many cows. I keep heifers and, and breed, and you know, I don't buy very many cows if I can if I can keep from it. I occasionally will buy one, but my my deal is buy a, a female and build off of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether you're going to flush or whether you're going to do whatever, but but take a female and build off of it. Well, the border collie thing's completely the same thought for me. So, so if I'm going to make a a border collie cross, I find more character in a puppy that's that's from the grand sire grand dams than i do from the sire and dam so i've always decided or always had the thought of i got to lot love not like but love three of the four grand sire grand dam there's one out of the three or four that you can just like mm-hmm. well since i started breeding dogs that way and i've got the i've got the ability to breed dogs that way because of the generations deep that i've bred but mm-hmm. to do that you don't have any throwaway so like in in the cow dog world especially there's a lot of dogs that, that we breed so much for bite you know we just breed bite bite and bite because right. you know that's that's what everybody we, we've still got to have a dog that wants to have some eye we still got to have a dog that wants to have some some brains because here here's the thing i mean everybody says well i need a real tough dog to work pairs on well i need what i need because i actually do this every day it's not it's not one of those things and i'm a straight dog trainer and i'm going to tell you you know how to do it I, I actually do it, so it's mm-hmm. it's a different thing that I have right. a different opinion, and I don't care whether I need to explain my opinion or not to somebody, <laughs> but I have an opinion. Right. And it, it is, I need a dog that's smarter. I need a smarter dog than I need a tougher dog. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've got to breed for some bite. I've got to have some bite. Mm-hmm. I can't ignore that. But I need a dog that, that's that's trainable and that's smart. Mm-hmm. And, the, and that's the thing is I need a dog that, you know, that, Every dog should bite when they're babies. Every dog should bite off of sheer adrenaline and, mm-hmm. and instinct. Mm-hmm. But then they damn sure better be smart enough to train them to bite them when you tell them to. Right. And if you can't do that, <laughs> then, then you know, well, I'll just give you a class example. You know, lots of these cows that, that I take care of are, are kind of, let's say, steel force Irish whiskey bred commercial cows. And, mm-hmm. they're, and they're, they can kind of be fairly flighty, if you will, or fairly uh, exotic acting. Mm-hmm. If you take one of those and let a dog chew on her very much and she goes to bellering and a hundred more want to come see what she's bellering <laughs> at, you just well pack your stuff and go to the house because you ain't going to get them cows moved by yourself that day. Right. So you right. got to have a dog that's smart enough not to pick a fight. you got to have a dog that, that's that's looking in the right places they're supposed to be looking at. So, so yeah, that that's kind of lengthy drawn out to what I was saying, but it's it's all the same thing. It's, it's, it's building off of females that produce. And and you're in a neat neat situation because because you take care of a lot of females uh, there as you were talking about uh, earlier you take a care of a lot of females and you have your own females and what what are most of those based off of one the ones you take care of and then and then two the ones that, that you have yourself so the, the cows I take care of most of those cows are really nice commercial kind of bred like whiskey bred kind of cow. Mm-hmm. Those guys will take care of cows for. We've got a, a, a small kind of red registered red Angus thing. They they own some some bull power with John Griswold that kind of enables some thought to to making some some other things other than the commercial cattle. You know they own mm-hmm. they own part of their money earned bull and part of Red Eagle and Aerosmith and Legacy and several of those bulls, which which is a cool opportunity for me because it enables me an opportunity to see the offspring of these bulls in a, in a large fashion. You know like. Right we might breed three or 400 head of cows this spring to, to money earned. Mm -hmm. So then I'll see three or 400 head and they may all be registered, registered Angus things, but I'll see what they are, what they can be, et cetera, you know? Mm -hmm. 
so that's what most of those cows are. There's a small red ang registered red angus thing we do. And then and the bulk of my cows is going to be a Simmental base. Now, I, I've kind of had to to build a Simmental herd uh, like a poor boy for the last multiple years and percent them up. I mean, we've got some purebred cows we've bought, but most of, most of our cows are, are, if they're purebred, they're definitely multiple generation purebreds because, because we've had to breed them up. Mm-hmm. So most of our cattle, so all, all these cattle in the sale, you know, they're, they're in good shape. They're in good running rig, but they're, they're not going to be silage fed, overly fat. And, and maybe they should be to, to give them a true representation of what these things are. But, you know, that's the next thing about Texas Panhandle, that everything that of my cows. So, so the first thing you've got to take into consideration is this this isn't like maybe new mexico tough but this isn't a very good part of the world for a cow to live Mm -hmm. so the the first thing you got to take into consideration is is what's that cow's efficiency going to be like so what what's it going to take to keep this cow in good running rig and 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 that's that's really how i've built a lot of a lot of my cows is is keeping heifer wise is you know them kind of hard doing need 50 pounds of silage a day kind of things these cows will be a little more moderate Mm -hmm but they're going to they're going to go to work probably they're well, not probably they're going to work in any environment because you know that these things have been like I said they're in good shape they're not hurting a bit and they've probably had a little more feed than than the average pasture running cow but you know they've up till shortly they've been running on buffalo grass and eating distillers so they've not <laughs> they've not had a, a manicured life right so these these things are going to go to work you know pretty much anywhere Right. And that and that that's a big thing for me, you know. Like I said, I I don't need a we we can't have we're in the wrong part of the world to have a eighteen hundred pound mature cow. We've gotta have a we've gotta have a mature cow in, in check and, and she she's gotta be moderate and she's gotta be an easy keeper. And you know, if, if we don't if we don't check those two boxes first, the the, the rest of it doesn't matter mm-hmm. because she 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 isn't gonna make a living in this part of the world. Because if, if she doesn't stay in good enough shape, some of these you know, just like this summer, for instance, you know, this summer got hot and dry. And then if a person wasn't paying attention, a cow could have started slipping pretty easy, but mm-hmm. just going through the summer, let alone going through the winter. Mm-hmm. And our winters can be cold enough, you know, we can have, we can have a ample amount of snow and we can sure be pretty cold. So mm-hmm. that that's the first thing about these cows is they've got to be set up to, to make a living. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, obviously we're going to, breed for feet and legs and we want it to be cool looking and we want it to be stout enough and you know we start marking all the checks but but that's kind of our first criteria is they've got to be able to they've got to be able to survive right so you can take those that that you work are you usually in your breeding program you usually a year or two behind some of those other bulls that that maybe uh those guys use and those cows you run yeah so like the lot one cow be bred to money earned mm-hmm. and that was after two calf crops of money earned calves i had seen uh-huh. Uh, already and i had already made up my mind that that was a direction that you know like some of these purebred simmental females that need to be making kind of half bud show heifers that's got a lot of stuff to them mm-hmm. uh that's certainly a that's certainly the direction i think that that can work you know i mean that bull adds a load of foot and bone and rib for an angus bull i mean that they, those those cattle are those cattle are super nice they really are right. so yeah i mean that's that's kind of giving me the opportunity going behind a lot of these bulls that we AI to on, on, our, on the ranch job thing that, that gives you the opportunity to kind of know what some of these bulls are, you know, how they breed. Because like I said, I mean, we, we give it a test. It's not like we're, it's not like we're going to breed six or eight cows and, and right. say, well, that, that thing worked or that thing didn't work. You know, right. we'll breed, we'll breed three or 400 cows out of way. So you, you, you're going to see, you're going to see how some of those cattle sure enough are. Right. What a great opportunity you have to, to see those. And, and I'm oh, sure, absolutely. and we don't have to name any names, but I'm sure there's some of those bulls that you're like, ah, you know, we've got, we've got a uh, hundred or 150 of those. And, and I don't think I'm going to use any of those. And so you can weed those out pretty easy. That's right. And I think that's that way with, with a lot of them, you know, I think what opportunity this gives you is maybe you're not going to be so quick to short one, you know, everybody's going right. to look at kids and, and be like, why well, I wouldn't use that one. Well, they maybe saw three. Right. Well, you know, you 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 maybe ain't gonna be so quick to to short one because because you you see three hundred of them or something. You know, that's it's a little different deal. And then you know you can look at some of these cattle and, and go, 
even if you don't love them, you can look at them and say, those things are perfect for the commercial world. Right. You know, they're, they're not going to fit what I'm doing, but I'd like to own a thousand of them in the feed yard. You know what I mean? So you've got right. obviously multiple ways to look at those things, right. but yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly a good opportunity. Uh, uh, it absolutely is. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you, you talk about being in with Griswold and those guys, why, uh, with, with the guys that you're running with, uh, you know, and there's probably some of those bulls in there that, that you can use uh, out of there that, that maybe your guys don't use and, and like. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no mm-hmm. doubt. I mean, there's – because their focus, you know, the, these guys I take care of cows for, their focus isn't going to be – uh, their focus isn't going to be on raising a show cow. They're probably not opposed to raising a good one if, right. if the opportunity was there, but that's not going to be, you know, their, their focus on AI and these bulls is, is probably what everybody's. And I've preached this forever that, you know, if you, if you take what it costs you to AI one and cut your bull power in half, you're mm-hmm. making money every year you do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing that, you know, how it is. I mean, like, Let's say you got a set of 150 cows Mm -hmm. and you got to turn out, you say you AI and then you're going to turn out, let's say you turn out three or four, whatever you turn out, clean up bulls. Mm -hmm. Well, if you had eight bulls on there instead of three or four, you got a whole lot higher chance of bulls getting crippled than you do four. You Mm -hmm. know, so I mean, all all that being said, I mean, it's, it's every bit of that's probably just a little bit better opportunity than just off the sheer size of some of those pastures of cows. You know, if you got... 10 head of cows and you need one bull that's one thing but right you know you got a thousand head of cows and you need 60 head of bulls or 70 head of bulls or whatever you need i mean that's another thing you know what i'm saying right yeah yeah and in your program uh are, are you using are you using mostly ai you running some bulls what 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 kind of what are you doing in that program so we AI to several of the you know the bulls that we like that are kind of the mm-hmm. trendy bulls and, I, and, I, and like i'll i'll, I'll hit on that again is i'm not i never have and i never will breed strictly a trend I'll, mm-hmm. if, if the trend fits a good one i'll breed to it but i'm never mm-hmm. gonna my, my main goal is always going to breed to create good ones not maybe maybe not going to forego that to raise a great one but so we have had an opportunity that's, that's been pretty good so we we own uh we own two bulls with uh tanner garrison that are, that are both out of the starstruck cow that that was uh, the mother of the wheel man that Foster Brothers campaigned that bull, and I thought those cattle were great. He was a steel four starstruck, and I mean those those cattle were good. They were mm-hmm. real good. Well, I've the this bull that I've got that's kind of my herd bull that that we clean up with, and I and I pasture expose how I think I need to to him, but he's a lock and load out of starstruck, and and he is he has been making some really great cattle for us. Some just a foot better than than what you could do on a lot of cleanup things uh those cattle are stout they've got some look they're they're big footed they're the cows i've kept they're gonna make really good females uh and then like i said you know i i still kind of go back to that keeping females that way because they're they're backed by a really good cow and then then the new bull we've got i ai'd some to him this year i didn't i didn't have him but i ai'd some to him this year that we call hollywood and he's a loaded up starstruck Mm-hmm. And that thing, that thing pictures. We'll, we'll actually offer a few lots of semen on that bull, and he pictured good. I mean, and he'd been running on cows for I don't know how long, and he still looked in good rig. And you can't make an animal any better on his feet and legs. And for the Simmental breed, that's a big thing. For one that's as sharp necked as he still wants to be, mm-hmm. that animal's a good one. He's mm-hmm. certainly a good one. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, and we got we got some semen lots to to talk about here in in the sale. We'll probably sell ten or twenty units of semen on. We haven't completely decided how we're going to sell. So we own uh, we own that bull with Tanner Garrison and Ryan Mowdy, and and we've not maybe meshed. We've used some semen on him. Everybody, all of us have used him. Uh, Ryan turned him out this spring, and so we'll he'll have several calves. And Tanner had, had cleaned up a little set before that, maybe on them year before early season and he has really good kids and everybody's real fired up and i don't i don't anticipate that we're going to try to make that seem and bring a fortune i just i, I just think we got to figure out our direction with it mm-hmm. you know i i think that i think that bull collects really good and he makes really good semen and there's no reason to not make some opportunity to sell it right yeah 
Well, we'll uh, we'll get into this sale here uh, in, in, in just a minute, but there's one thing that you and I talked about that we haven't hit on yet that I think is, is just really cool. Uh, tell us about your, you're an avid hunter. You go to your Facebook page and, and you look down through there and, and you've got pictures of hunting on there. And, and you said that you were really uh, into a hunting, uh, hunting operation when you were a few years back. Yeah, so whenever I graduated from college, straight out of OSU, I had I had two I had two options basically at the time. So I I could kind of follow the footsteps of my dad and maybe go be a banker, and that didn't sound like very much fun to me. <laughs> the, you then, don't sound like the banking type. Oh, I, I don't I don't really even like bankers. If you want to know the truth, all they ever do is want their money back, and I <laughs> sometimes that shit gets old. But Why is that? I uh, I I actually at that time. I, I was still in college and I'd, I'd even had a, a couple of outside training dogs, bird dogs. I was training for some customers and I'd had the opportunity, uh, through a local guy that was in the business to book some quail hunts, you know, and, and it just kind of kept seeming like one thing or another. So I graduated, I we just went in and I went kind of in with the dew cranch and they already had a lodge and they had already, we had already at that time, we had already done some deer hunts for several years in a row right there around that time we'd we'd done some deer hunts with real tree and done some video deer hunts and shot some good deer and you know had had some opportunities like uh, nikon optics invited us to go to the shot show in las vegas that year that they come and hunted and i mean it, wow. they yeah. kind of offered some pretty neat opportunities but the bird hunting thing was kind of my my focus and we stepped out there for quite a few years and, and that was kind of i mean we took care of cows but we we hunted a lot Mm-hmm. And and it and it was good. We we'd probably spend I don't know. There were several years there. You'd probably spend ninety ninety to a hundred days a year hunting with customers. I mean, it was it was a lot of work, but it was a good deal. And then we'd run a real extensive antelope camp. So so Texas Texas does their antelope. You you can't draw. I mean, you could draw like a. a a, a one or two permit in the whole state on public ground kind of thing or something but mm-hmm. so they land owner draw mm-hmm. and you and, and it's a 10-day season and so you draw permits and then and then like i said with the duke ranch we got multiple permits and then you you have to acquire other landowner owned permits if you want if you need more permits so so probably somewhere in the vicinity of 2008 to 2012 or 2006 2006 2012 mm-hmm. we'd run a full service uh, antelope camp uh, the drought the drought the 2012 kind of put us out because it just got to where you the, right. the numbers wasn't there but mm-hmm. you know we'd run somewhere between 15 and 25 guys in a 10 day season for, Jeez. you know, that six, six, eight year time span there. And, and, and had a lot of success, you know, had had several, several antelope make record book, had the, had the biggest one shot. I think it was 2006. We shot the biggest one that was taken in the state of Texas that year. I mean, we'd had, we had a fair amount of success and that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you had a lot of really neat customers in, in that, in that part of it, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a neat opportunity, but it was a lot of fun. Right. I know some guys around here, right, right around here right now with whitetail season. And, uh, these guys are going crazy and, uh, I'm sure they would, they'd love to be able to get out there and, and uh, be guided by a, by a good Texas deal and a, and a good Texas hunt. So, you know, and, and we obviously aren't going to shoot as big a deer as, as what y'all are, but, but we're far enough North, you know, we, we shot, we shot nice deer, um, mm-hmm. still do, but, but we're close enough to Kansas, you know, we, we have a branch apart from, from maybe what your typical central Texas deer is going to look like, you know, those, those genetics are, we maybe don't have them great big, but we have a bigger bodied, heavier horned, you know, a little more Kansas looking kind of white tail in, in our area. And we'll still shoot, you know, we'll still shoot 150 to 180 inch white tail in this part of the world. So, I mean, we still shoot certainly respectable deer. Right. Yeah, well, that's, that sounds awesome. Yeah, and to be able to go out uh, to do that that many days a year, uh, man, that's got to make a lot of guys jealous as well. So, you know, it, it, it you know it's just like anything else though. At at some point, it's just some days you just seem like you're going to the office. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, not, it's easy. It's easy for somebody to say, "Oh, I'd never get that away," because I said that. But right. you know, there's there's some of them days that the wind the wind blows in the Texas Panhandle all the damn time. Right. And there's some of them days that you got to get out there and hunt quail, and the wind's blowing forty mile an hour. You're, <laughs> the fun the fun falls off of it pretty quick. Right. Yeah, you thought you were shooting one way to quail, and he's over the other way with all the gone. Wind. <laughs> yeah, he he's he's gone. <laughs> I, I'm like you. I think there's a lot of guys that say there isn't any way that could ever get old. But, but you know, it, it wasn't a, anything other than a full-time job because, you know, we have we have kennel of dogs. We'd have 25 or 30 head of bird dogs in the kennel, and we had, you know, we'd run several trucks of guides and hunters. And, I mean, it was, it, it was, it was more than just for the fun of it thing. I mean, it, it, right. you – it, it 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 was a job. I mean, you had to you had to kind of keep your head on a swivel and keep your dog sound. And then and then the off season, you know, you can't no, no matter how you do that, you can't afford to. At least I, as I didn't feel like I could afford to because I had the I had the ability to train dogs. I didn't feel like you could afford to continue to buy broke dogs to keep your kennel full. So so all during the off season, so you'd hunt all season long, and then all during the off season before and after you'd spend training dogs so you know you'd end up somewhere between 250 and 300 days a year behind a bird dog wow how do you have time for so you know do that (laughs) yeah it's at some at some point you're it's sure enough turned into a job right we we'd still be doing it if it you know we had the drought to 2011 12 13 whatever that Mm -hmm. was you know that was just devastating just Mm -hmm. worst thing you've ever seen and and, and was as persistent, you know, it was, it, it didn't rain for, I don't know how many months, 28 months or something, never even rained. I don't remember what it was, but it was, it was, it was pretty much hell on earth around here. And, and it, and it kind of wiped a lot of the wildlife population off of, mm-hmm. of doing, you know, well, just like hunting whitetail, you're really dependent on mother nature for those things to have nutrition, to grow big horns and things right. like that. So, I mean, you ended up with, you ended up with, uh, a lacking all the way around right so you know we, we we made that decision at some point i don't remember exactly when that was that it was time to maybe give everything a rest and mm-hmm. and uh you know how it is you turn your focus hard focus if you focus on something you turn a hard focus to something else right and then here in a minute you don't it's hard to get back into something yeah and you you turn that focus to your cattle and your herd i'm guessing Mm-hmm. and making it more successful that was along the same times that i was you know i was still partnered with with dukes on some cows and and, and taking care of ranch cows you know we had we hadn't cold enough during the drought you know i mean feeding mm-hmm. cows to keep it as many as we could you know we were feeding silage and feeding whatever we were feeding to keep cows around and we, you know we probably had 2500 head of mother cows around it so i mean it, wow. once the drought kind of kicked in it, it it took all hands on deck just to be able to feed enough cows right yeah that'd be a lot of cows to to handle in a drought it's a lot of cows it's too many cows there's too (laughs) many cows for most for most scenarios it really is well let's uh phil if you're ready let's get into these these sale cattle that you have uh again the the sale on december 8th uh, on sc online sales you've got 13 13 lots of cattle and then we've got uh, that semen and some dogs that we've already kind of hit on but we'll hit on them again uh you got some of them you haven't talked about yet so let's get into these cattle here and uh we've got some uh we've got a little bit of a uh, little bit of variety here uh but like you say they're they're good ones and and uh, doesn't matter what breed but but they're good ones and you start off here lot one with a with a purebred semi yeah, so she'd be like a four-year-old cow. She would be a grand fortune out of the Azalea count. Azalea is probably one of the only cows of purebred cows I ever bought, and I bought her out of I bought her from David Barry out of Shipman's sale, the Black Label sale, and uh, she's an outcross. Uh, called that bull Star Player. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a star player out of a uh, cow called Beauty that was a that was a built right cow. Uh, so that. That that azalea cow kind of lends a lot of foundation into a lot of the purebred cows that, that I've got, as, as well as one of the bulls that we we actually just lost that we we used real heavy because when I bought that cow, he was in the belly of that cow that we called stepping out. But so this cow's a grand fortune out of azalea, and uh, she is a sound-footed, slick, slick neck, big-bellied, just 
real moderate, kind of different from a Simmental type of cow. Has crossed really well to broker. I've had several, well, I've had one nice broker out of her, but super, super sound, really good uttered, makes a lot of milk. A cow's bred, uh, like 524 are going to be bred to money earned. Mm-hmm. So, okay. so to make a to make a half blood, uh, that thing does have a cleanup bull. So she would be she, her cleanup. If she wasn't happen to be AI bred, her cleanup's going to be a bull that is a, a D two sixty seven ten is would be purebred red Angus bull, and that that sixty seven ten is a red Angus cow that I actually sold out of one of my previous online sales for like ten thousand, like super nice red Angus cow. Uh, so the cleanup would be that bull would be the cleanup on on several of these lots or pasture exposed them and coming behind the breed. But yeah, so that's a really nice cow to start with. And then, like I said, that goes back to that azalea cow that's just done really good things for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and from the time of recording till when you get this thing up, why you'll have you have all that information. You'll have them preg checked and and pretty well know who's who and what's what on. The everything is preg checked, but we'll go through and 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 re preg to try to get a a tighter prediction on on that yeah absolutely okay Okay. yeah and then you're offering the lot two and she's a she's a daughter out of the lot one yeah so she would be a drifter which was was one of the bulls we talked about earlier that was a starstruck Mm -hmm. son the the lock and load starstruck flat phenomenal female she's a little bit monkey color she's kind of one of them it gets that semi look that gets just a nickel of red across top of her back but i mean she is a jack necked huge ribbed big hip stout just really really nice female she'd be ai bred or ai service to legacy mm-hmm. just just gonna be i mean this thing's gonna be a stand-up good cow i mean just way way sprung out in the middle of her rib just travels like a cat and really really big square hip in her i mean just just a nice cow mm-hmm. and she's a bred heifer correct bred heifer yes sir yeah. okay good deal yeah, and then we go uh, a little bit Angus bred here on the lot three. Yeah, it's got a five-year-old uh, brilliance daughter out of a pioneer cow. And that, that cow is actually a cow that was one of the first cows that paper cow-wise that we ever did much flushing or breeding on. But we called that cow sorority sister. But she was a pioneer net worth, I think. Mm-hmm. And that this one's a been natural calf out of that cow. But so... I don't keep much Angus papers on her, so I don't have an Angus number, but, but I can can and will if, if somebody so desires to, to paper this one. But So she would be a five-year-old. Uh, she's had several really nice calves. I kind of breed these Angus cows, not necessarily with the mindset of selling very many of them, but I kind of keep these Angus cows where I've, I've got a, a foundation to kind of keep making half-bloods uh, going back seven tall on them. And uh, so that's kind of why what i've done there but uh, she actually would be uh, exposed to the drifter bull mm-hmm. and she pregged far along I and mean, i think she i think she cares like january uh exposed to the drifter bull for a half blood okay good deal yeah we got a gold standard is lot four yep so she'd be a gold standard out of the lot three cow she'd be a gold standard out of the brilliance cow Made a lot like the Brilliance cow, just a real solid Angus cow, big ribbed, real pretty necked, you know, just super functional, really pretty uttered cattle. Uh, same same type that, you know, just in my mind, they're the, they're, they're the right kind to kind of breed back to a Simmental bull, you know, moderate, but not, not so moderate that you're going to give up too much grow. Uh, but just, she's really just a really nice, real pretty, going to be really big ribbed. Has probably a nickel more length of spine than the Brilliance cow does. And may actually even be one that's going to be a nickel bigger than the Brilliance cow. But certainly got got a cool look to her. She's really long, cool necked. Uh, just really good on her feet and legs. She would be AI service to what we call 067U, who was... Uh, a first look legend good then uh lot five we go purebred red angus yeah so that that cow actually belongs to her heifer belongs to the guys i take care of cows for she'd mm-hmm. be kind of an ivf deal uh she's a detour out of a flat water gang red red angus bred cow she's cool she's she's just a flat good one i mean she's she's super powerful uh big enough footed 
got enough look to her. I mean, really, really sprung apart in the center of her rib. I mean, one, I think you can do quite a bit of stuff with breeding piece wise. She just packs a lot of power, but still, still got enough look, you know, I mean, she's not going to be one of them ones that just gives up too much of it. And she, she's a, I bred to a, a sex tap for wide load semen, the mm -hmm. red Angus wide load. Right, so you got sex heifer on there. So uh, these guys want females. Why should be? And the cow she's out of is a hell of a cow. I mean, that to me, that one, you know, you're, you've got a, you've got a little predictability. But by the time you'd get another female out of that, you know, you're gaining some ground on, on some generations deep to kind of know what they're looking like. Mm -hmm. Right. And lot six, you use that sex heifer uh, semen again on this one. Yeah. So lot six is a drifter. Uh, she's a red. She's a red star headed drifter and she she's probably she's probably one of my favorite drifters we've ever offered. She's she's super nice. Uh super, super nice. She's a big rib, big bodied, just just good kind of cow. Got a lot of look to her. Super, super sound, plenty big in her feet. Uh got uh, you know, I mean she's sure stout enough boned and, and, and pretty good aired. And she would be AI to sex after wide load. You like offering these drifters, don't you? We got. Love, I love the drifter cattle. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely do. Yeah, you got another uh, one here for lot seven. Yeah, we, we'll have several of them. Lot mm -hmm. seven is a lot seven's a drifter out of a basic instinct cow. Mm -hmm. She's a. Uh, she looks like a. You know, she looks like how she's bred. She's she's cool looking. She's good haired. She's gonna be a, a tick more moderate, but just way big bodied. Got a lot of rib shape to her really really sound and she's powerful enough uh you know i mean she's she's not one that gives up so much power being being she's sure stout enough but i mean she's dang sure functional out of a cow that that goes back to you know couple, several generations of cows that that we kind of commercial angus bred that that just kind of got better every generation but but certainly produce uh that that whole line of those cows that that actually was a kind of an angus she went back to several generations ago angus cow that that i'd got from from griswold you know and, and, and we bred you know her mother's about a third time around of keeping females out of that that line and and, and they just kind of make them just like that every time and they're they're certainly good cattle mm -hmm. right cbai service to legacy okay good deal a lot eight a uh, lot eight we go back a little angus based yeah, so, so Lot 8 would be a half-blood Simmental. She's sired by a bull that Ryan Mowdy owns that we, we call 409. And he actually is bred like broker, but but not like broker. So he would be a steel force out of a full sister to broker's dam. Mm -hmm. And we sold several of these things that are good cattle. Uh, I mean, I mean, like, sure enough, good cattle. I sold a purebred Tanner Garrison this year that was out of an, an extra X2 daughter that that, I mean, that thing's flat good. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say these things are going to breed up and be just like brokers, but they bring you some of the same character that you like, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm saying. This cow's stout. She's long spine, sound, cool looking, big bellied. I mean, just, just really set up to be a brood cow. She's out of a, out of a commercial Angus cow and she would be, her AI service would be to gold standard. But this, this is certainly one to, this is certainly be one to, to, to keep an eye on. I mean, this thing's just got loads of rib shape and loads of power and, you know, all the things you like about the brokers, but not being a broker. Right. Yeah, bread, bread like her. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, tell us about the lot nine. Nine's a stepping out, basic instinct. Stepping out was the bull that I referenced earlier that, he actually would have been in the in the belly to the azalea cow when we bought azalea, and he was a uh, two step little Kyle Walters raise that Hudson Pines had that that I watched show at the uh, Simmental's breeder sweepstakes that I thought was I thought was a sure enough good one. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought that bull was as, as good as you can make him. Mean, he was just a three quarter blood, but so stepping out would be sired by him, and and you know it was one of those deals that that after you watch that bull show he. He died shortly thereafter, and there was like 14 units of semen on him, so you couldn't even get semen, and, and I had to buy this cow bread to him. And, and this bull was, was really nice. I mean, he made really, really nice females. They're, they're, some of them are, are tick throaty. I mean, they, they, they have a semi look to them, but they're, they're good haired and huge bodied and super mm -hmm. sound and put a great big old foot to the ground. I mean, just, just as functional as you can make one. 
and that's exactly how this female is. I mean, she's good looking, but she is way big bodied and functional and sound and, and just puts a really, really big foot to the ground, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like you turn out and you don't, you don't worry about them and away they go. She'd be AI service to those six, seven, you bull. Okay. Good deal. Yeah. Lot 10, we go back purebred semi. Yeah. That, that, this thing's a nickel younger. But this this one's really good. I mean, like this one, show heifer should have been. Uh, she's really sharp neck, huge legged, really sound, and I mean, just super super complete. I probably like this one for a purebred is is about as well as you could make a lot of purebreds. I mean, she's she's obviously time will tell, but she is super nice. And like I said, just as complete as you can make her. Got a lot of rib shape. Uh, she would be a drifter out of a grand fortune young gun which young gun was a bull that that we used to own with with jared shipman that was a stone hinge out of a half sister to broker um mm-hmm. that, that was kind of a foundation he kind of old school bred bull but cert, certainly made made as good uttered females you know he, he put the feet on the ground right and they made good udders and maybe didn't do everything else you wanted but he did those two things and this this, this female certainly her mother's same way you know Really good uttered, makes a lot of milk, puts feet right, just just mm-hmm. a good kind of cattle. But th- this one's got a just you know sure enough shot extra look over what a lot of them have had. Mm-hmm. Versatile, you can go go either way or a lot of ways with her. Yeah, I mean th- this one's this one's one you ready to show heifer out of, or you can go take her breeder club calf. I mean she just she just good cattle, you right. know. I mean just no doubt about it. Right, we like those kind. We like those kind. Got uh, drifter here for lot eleven. Lot 11's a drifter. I have a whiskey cow that I've sold lots of heifers out of this whiskey cow that are good. I mean, this one's this one's stout, hairy. She's a, she's a tick younger, too. Mm-hmm. So she'll look a little greener than, than some of these others. But, but I mean, this one's, this one, when she rolls around to a four-year-old year, somebody's going to be awful proud to own this one. Mm-hmm. She'd be AI service to legacy. Uh, but, I mean, like, we're talking – Big time hair, really good footed, and 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 really kind of going to be real geeky neck. Mm-hmm. The lot twelve, uh, a drifter as well. Drifter out of a first impression mm-hmm. cow, uh, purebred Angus cow. She's a lot, a lot the same to the twelve. She's good haired. She's geeky necked. Um, you know, just probably a, a little younger you know she might have been an april born calf instead of a february or march you know she's she's a little younger than than some of these others but man she's she's got all the right parts really really cool in her lines uh really hits the ground right really really kind of has a cocky look to her mm-hmm. i probably anticipate this one to kind of look really cool come picture day yeah. and she would be i think she's a legacy on her uh ai service as well Okay. And again, just check that on SC. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're not watching it on or not seeing the things on SC yet, why uh, uh, check that and, and get all that information. And Yeah, I'll have, I'll have that posted. Um, I'll probably, we'll probably attach a supplement sheet with the breed up and the, and the pedigree as far as like the bull crosses and things like that. So, so it's going to be a little easier to find than having to find it through in the footnotes. We'll, we'll probably post it. We'll probably post a, a supplement sheet on that sale. Mm-hmm. Now, the 13, we go away from the Angus, away from the semi. Uh, we've got a composite Charlet here. Yeah, so she's sired by a bull that we actually raised on an embryo deal. We bought some, some embryos, and she she's by a bull we called 726X, which was a chunky monkey snowflake. And snowflake, she is the mother of that cow that, that Thorne bought from Kephart that they called K-Bar 008. Mm-hmm. Uh, this cow's good. She's real intriguing. I mean, I think Club Kef guy has got to really appreciate what she can offer. This one is, this one is a big time powerhouse. I mean, just stout as can be, but just got loads and loads and loads of rib shape and just, just sure natural depth to her. Uh, hits the ground right. Really good colored. Gonna have a big old stout square hip in her. I mean, just real functional kind of female to go back on some of these some of these kind of tricked out bred bulls and she'd be you know by pedigree she'd be clean of defects to worry about Mm -hmm. and then she would have an ai service to uh chris black's easy street bull good 
And then we throw in a few few extra lots here. We got a, a couple semen lots, you think, uh, and, and still deciding on that just a bit there to Hollywood. Yeah, so we'll the the bull that we've talked about that, that we own with Maddie and Garrison, it's the loaded up starstruck. We we're we're really, really high on that bull and I we'll for sure put, you know, a few lots in, but I just not sure how how many we're doing. But I I, I probably say we're gonna put ten units, two lots of five or something in there to, to the Hollywood, the, the loaded up starstruck. But yeah, I I really I really look for that bull to do some pretty neat stuff. I mean he's He's just so so perfect, feet mm -hmm. and legs hitting the ground. I mean, and still still carries a lot of style and and, and depth and natural thickness. I mean, he's just he's yeah, and he's pretty easy keeper, which you obviously know that that's checks big right. big checks on my list because he they kind of need to be. And then the the ones that cause all the stir, you got a couple dogs on this sale as well. Yeah, so we'll sell three total. The first lot of dogs we'll sell will be a a male puppy out of the mist female and she'll be that puppy will be sired by a, a dog called twice it's it's a it's a line bred tie that's a dog that that i that i raised that actually lives in northern california now on, on a ranch that made a super nice cow dog but so it goes back same thing you know those crosses we we gotta we gotta mark the check so we gotta make sure we like we got we gotta like what we're doing and and, and i mean just just this missed female herself, you know, she's just, she's so good. So I, I kind of, I'll kind of paint a picture for you. Some of the scenarios of how we use these things, I'll kind of paint a picture. So, so let's say, uh, I'm going to go down here where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of this set of pins where the, where these sale cattle are at and, and they're kind of in a bottom lot. And let's say I'm going to get these things up and I want to sort two cows off and I'm going to, I'm going to clip them or I'm going to do something. So I, I'll actually go open the gate and I'll send that dog down to the bottom of that trap to the backside of them cattle and she, and then that's what we call a fetch. So those dogs will will, will come around and they, and they'll engage those cattle and then they'll 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 do what they call lift. So that's whenever they they make contact, it's where they're going to lift and they're going to basically they're going to bring those cattle to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Now that's natural. That's that's natural things. The, the things we do is we we change on the natural, but that's natural things. So, so all we've done there is just put a little bit of direction to her natural instinct. Mm -hmm. So then that's, that's, we'll pin them things. And so then I'll, I'll go bring them in, shut a gate behind them. She'll come around, hold them. Well, so then I'll send her back to around and we'll go and we'll put them up the alley. Mm -hmm. Well, so we, we got to sort two cows off. Right. So what I'll do then is I'll get on a gate, like you would be in and by with somebody running cows to you. And I send that dog on the back side of them cattle in the alley. And she starts bringing them mm -hmm. and you put just enough pressure on them cattle that you can stop them and let them go one at a time. And you run your, your cut gate because that dog is on the backside of them cattle, keeping pressure, bringing them to you. So you can go in and buy sorting mm -hmm. on those cattle as, as they're bringing them to you. Mm -hmm. So, so then, you know, that's a small everyday chore, you know, like everyday chores I do. Like, so I got, I got cattle at the house that they're in the butcher pen and then I got, other cattle that are in there on feed well they don't mm -hmm. get to pet the same feed so you know i'll go stand in the gate and send my send a dog around the back side of them and we'll <laughs> two or three minutes we'll sort one set from another set and we'll feed right. well you you're not going to do that without a dog i'm not going to do it without a dog right right so anyway that's that's kind of how we use them and then we use them outside we use them a bunch outside to help gather cattle and and move cows and you know things of that nature but mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a small little dose of how we we do things around you know around the pins and stuff we use them use them every day around the pins mm -hmm. uh doing something of some kind but so the miss dog she's like i said earlier she's kind of the matriarch of, of our females uh i typically don't sell many pups out of her so so you know i don't know if someone should find this a fortunate opportunity or not a fortunate opportunity but this will be the <laughs> you know this will be a male pup out of her that that will be they're on the ground now we'll picture him and they uh -huh. will be ready you know just right before christmas time great great good good christmas present for somebody absolutely yeah. absolutely yep and the, and these things so it goes back same thing these things will work you know they're guaranteed uh -huh. to work uh, uh -huh. they're, they may not be guaranteed to make a cow dog and i can't fix things that you've done wrong to them and things like that but i guarantee you, you know these dogs will work Mm -hmm. uh so so like you know that's one thing i want to stress is you you buy a dog you're welcome to send that dog back here for training 
Mm -hmm. or you're welcome to stay on the phone as much as you want to stay on the phone (laughs) and and make sure you don't mess one up here. I'm, I'm, I'm open to either or. Right. Right. Good. So then the next dog in the, in the lineup will be, a. she's actually sired by a, a dog that would be a half brother to the miss dog maternal maternal brother called frosty mm-hmm. out of a bay bitch that, that is kind of one of my everyday dogs and she'd be six months old or so so she's just kind of getting you know she's got not just a lot of formal training she's had some place training she's uh <clears throat> she's been hauled a little bit so you know I, I don't want i don't want anyone to expect there'll be videos of this dog and there'll be as true representation as I can make them, but I don't want anybody mm-hmm. to expect this dog to be, you know, a, a working cow dog. She is, she has got all the parts to be a great one, mm-hmm. but she, she's just, she is what she is. Uh, she's really, really turned on the stock. Uh, she really, really wants to work stock. I mean, she's got lots of things going about her. That's just as cool as you can make them. Mm-hmm. We, her name will be L7 Quanta. So she, and she'll, she'll certainly be one, but, and then the last dog in the sale be a dog called L7 Mavis. She, she'll be sired by a grandson of the, the rip dog that, that we talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, I got a couple of guys trying to beep in right now. <laughs> got me distracted. <laughs> she'll, be, uh, she'll be about a year old. Um, she's, she's had a little more training, but, but she's still one that, that, that I'm going to say is just ready to start training. Mm-hmm super nice dog really really wants to have a lot of bite wants to really kind of have some feel and gather up her stock uh she's she's a pretty dog and she's she's pretty easy to be around and you know wants wants to get along mm-hmm. but she like i said she'll be she'll actually be a year old the middle of december so she's just right about a year old which you know a lot of guys don't really start a cow dog till they're till they're roughly a year old but but she she wants to have a lot of bite. She's she's bred to kind of be a cow dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, she'll I'll guarantee that dog. I mean I guarantee any of them to 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 work. I mean mm-hmm. that she's already really turned on to her stock. She's been on she's been on little calves. She's been on her open cattle kind of uh, stock. Um, mm-hmm. But she's she's one. If a guy was you know serious about wanting a dog to to train to have a, a working companion she's she's old enough and right there ready to start doing something yeah well that sounds great yeah i don't know that uh i don't know that we've ever had any dogs on uh, before the bid podcast so uh i think that's a i think that's a great thing a, a great addition here this will probably be the fourth year that we've offered border collies of some fashion on on the sale mm-hmm. okay well good deal and, and getting along well with those and uh, Phil, man, I, I appreciate your time. Appreciate you uh, talking about the program there that you guys have and, and the history and things. And uh, appreciate you talking these cattle. And and uh, since you since you don't have them pictured yet here on recording day, well, I haven't got to see them. But uh, man, I sure am looking forward to it and and having this podcast video put together. And and uh, man, I want to wish you luck there on the on the sale there on December eighth again on on SC online sale. And uh, just uh, want to wish you luck with all of that, Phil, and and uh, the dogs and, and the semen as well. Uh, man, I appreciate it. All right. Uh, again, uh, it need to uh, need to get a hold of you, Phil. Uh, we can do that through through Facebook. Look up Phil Williams. Uh, you're on there. Uh, look on SC, and, and they can give you a call anytime, text anytime, and and uh, you'll be having talk, happy to talk to them, right? Yeah, and, and you can find we've got a kind of ranch ranch business page. It'd, it'd be It'll be Williams cattle slash L7 stock dogs. Okay. And that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good avenue to, to, to follow to kind of see a lot of what we've got going on. We, we we try to stay pretty active there. Okay. Well that's a great thing. Yeah, visit visit all of those things and, and make sure to catch the sale on SC on December eighth. Phil, I appreciate it very much, man. You bet. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we want to thank you for listening to another edition of Before the Bid Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Before the Bid. For more information and to learn more about upcoming podcasts and sales, visit us at beforethebid.podbeam.com or Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram pages. For information on being a guest on Before the Bid, please email us at beforethebid at gmail.com or one of our social media pages. Remember, that's beforethebid at gmail.com. 
Happy sales to you, and we will talk to you next time on Before the Bid.